Bay, and uh, it's been a beautiful day, and just glad to glad to be back in church tonight. Excited to hear Brother Jacob here in just a little while. Y'all be praying for him as he comes. Looking forward to uh, to hearing him. Uh, is there any announcements tonight before we move forward? No announcements. No word. Quiet bunch. Tell you what. And that extra area. Huh? It's a pretty bunch. It is a pretty bunch. I don't even want to get down from up here. You're going to have to preach loud. It's been dark for about three hours now. Anyways, well, good day. Well, we're glad that you're here tonight. Just ask you to mind the Lord and worship with us tonight and uh, be praying for Brother Jay. So, Sam, you care to take us the Lord in prayer tonight?
God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. Jason, what did you ask me to sing now? It's mad cows kicking in here. I'm I'm aware of everything that's wrong with me. Still, you accept me anyway. I live with a past I can't get past, and it still haunts me. So, I'm asking for the courage to make a change. <laughs> By your grace. I have hope You've already paid Every debt I owe Please take these chains And make me see By your grace I've been set free me, Lord, to seek you day by day, that only you declare just what I stand. Let me not take for granted all the depths of your forgiveness, because the only way I'm going to be a better man, by your grace. already paid every debt I owe. Please take these chains and make me see that by your grace I've been set free. Well, I've got a long way to go, but Lord, I know there's not a step you're not with me And I've got a long way to go Oh, but Lord, I know There's not a step I'm gonna take When you're not with me You're always with me And by your grace I have hope you already paid Every day I hope Please take these chains Make me see By your grace I've been set free Good evening. Good, evening. good evening. It's good to be back in the house of God tonight. Amen. 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 
telling you this afternoon was a struggle because uh, as a young preacher having to follow what happened here this morning, the devil's going to put in your head that, you know, you're not able and you can't, you know, you're not able to fill the shoes that God's called you to fill. But as we're going to talk about tonight, it don't matter because like that song, Gratitude says, we can't give him anything but just ourselves and our worship and our service. So Amen. just pray for us tonight. And uh, we're going to be in Proverbs chapter 11 tonight. If y'all don't mind to turn there and stand, we're going to be there. And then we're going to also go to James chapter 1 after we're in Proverbs for a little while. So we're going to be in a couple different places tonight. Before we start tonight, there's a young man on my heart that's really dear to me and Malachi. Uh, some of you probably heard what's going on, and I just ask for y'all to pray for him, please. He holds a special place in my heart, and I know he does in Mal's as well. So I just ask that y'all keep him in your prayers, please. But tonight we're going to be talking about living with integrity. A lot of times as Christians, we think once we're saved that everything's going to be roses and flowers and rainbows and unicorns but the truth is it's not that at all so tonight we're going to talk about living with integrity living with integrity we're going to read four verses in proverbs chapter 11 starting in verse number one it says a false balance is abomination to the lord but a just way is his delight when pride cometh then cometh shame but with the lowly is wisdom. The integrity of the upright shall guide them, but the perverseness of, transgress of transgressors shall destroy them. Riches profit not in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivereth from death. Let us pray tonight. God, we just thank you tonight, God, for allowing us to come back to your house, God. We, we thank you for how you moved this morning, God. We thank you for the soul that was saved, God, and the, the six new members you allowed to come join this church today, God. We thank you for the life that was rededicated back to you. I pray for each of those individuals, God, because if they took a step to you, God, Satan's going to fight them harder than he ever has. And I just pray for them, God, that you would just give them the courage and the boldness to live for you, God. And we just pray for the service tonight, God, the rest of it, God. Pray that you just use this word that you've given me, God. I'm coming to you humbly, God. I'm unworthy to stand here and preach your word, so I just pray that you would just use me tonight, hide me behind your cross. I just pray that this message could speak to somebody's heart in the way you'd have it speak to them, God. If someone here is lost, God, they'd be saved. If someone here is walked away from you, God, they're not living with integrity, God, that tonight there would be a difference made in their life, and we just thank you and ask all this in your name. Amen and amen. Y'all can be seated. Before we get started tonight, integrity, the definition of integrity according to dictionary.com is the quality of being honest and having strong moral principles, moral uprightness, or the state of being whole and undivided. I think a lot of times when we think of our Christian walk, we think of our character or how we live, but a lot of times we don't think about living and being having integrity about ourselves and I think there's plenty of examples of men and women throughout the Bible who lived with integrity and I think a lot of times in today's society especially in the American church that integrity does not go talked about it's we became a society that we're okay with sin we're okay with unrighteous living and God still has called us to a higher standard, just like he did all these people in the Bible. So tonight, I just want to look at a few points, get y'all out of here. Um, the first point we want to bring up tonight is pride leads to destruction. Pride leads to destruction. Verse number two there in Proverbs tells us that when pride cometh, then cometh shame. But with the lowly is wisdom. And you can replace lowly there in verse number two with humble. So but with humble, but with the humble is wisdom. How many times when we mess up and we sin, we in that moment of sin, in that season of sin, when that sin's fun or we're having a good time, we enjoy it, but then as soon as that season of sin passes, we're ashamed. We're overcome with shame of ourselves. We're ashamed of how we're living. We're ashamed of how we carried ourselves. 
but if you'll flip over with me to Proverbs 16, verse 18, there's one, a verse I want to read. It tells us, Proverbs 16, verse 18, tells us, Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before the fall. See, we let our pride get to us, and we're ashamed of how we're living. We're ashamed of how we are carrying ourselves. We're ashamed of the sin that's created this gap between us and God, but our pride prevents us from being selfless and, and going to God and seeking Him out on how we can conquer this sin because, newsflash, you can't conquer your sin on your own. You can try it all you want, but you're not going to be able to conquer the sin that you're struggling with on your own. There's numerous examples. When David messed up, he lusted after Bathsheba. We know the story. What happens? He lusts after Bathsheba. He goes and gets her. They sleep together. There's a child. She ends up becoming pregnant. And then David tries to get her husband, calls him home from the battle, gets him drunk, tries to get him to go sleep with her to cover up his mistake. But that doesn't work. So he gets Uriah the Hittite murdered. So David's one little slip up, one little instance of his pride getting in the way led to a whole disaster and destruction of sin in his life. But David's problem was his pride got in the way. Once he made the first mistake, he didn't just go seek out God. He didn't repent of what he did. He just tried to cover it up. And we do the same thing when we mess up. We just try to cover it up and hide it. And you may be able to hide it from the church. You may be able to hide it from Brother Nick. You may be able to hide it from your Sunday school teacher. Kids, y'all may can hide it from Mom and Dad. But... God sees it all. God knows where you messed up. And when you allow your pride and your sinful ways to get take control in your life, that's going to prevent you from being effective and being a Christian every day because that pride and that sin that you're struggling with is just going to create this gap between you and God. And we're going to talk about it here in a little bit, but your heart will eventually become callous. And you're not going to, that conviction is, there will become a time where you, you hardly even feel that conviction. So you need to take care of that before you become calloused. The second thing I'd like to talk about tonight is the deceit of your unfaithfulness leads to death spiritually. Verses 3 through 4 talk, tell us that the integrity of the upright shall guide them, but the perverseness of transgressors shall destroy them. Riches profit not in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivereth from death. Deceit means to be misleading or conceal the truth. How many of you have been caught deceiving somebody from something? Maybe you didn't necessarily not tell the whole truth, but you didn't, or you, sorry, maybe you didn't lie about the entire thing, but you misconstrued the story or you changed it up a little bit and you didn't tell the whole truth. You lied just a little bit about it. See, Satan does the same thing to us. He gets in our head. Just say, I'll mess up and do something. He'll, he'll come and say, he'll get in your ear and he'll say, well, look what Ben's doing. Your sin's not as bad as his. Or look at what Caleb's doing. His, your sin's not as bad as what he's doing. Or you're not living as bad as he's living. Or, well, look at that person on TV that just got arrested. You're not living as bad as they are. You're just making these little mistakes. But you see... God doesn't see little mistakes or big mistakes. It's all just sin, black and white in his eyes. Amen. But you see, Satan doesn't care about confusing the lost people and the people outside the church. He wants to confuse us because when the church is not being effective, he's got free reign. He can do whatever he wants because those people who don't know what's right and wrong, it don't matter to them how they live because they don't have a higher purpose for them to live for like we do. So Satan's going to get in your mind and he's going to deceive you. He's going to lead you to think that you're okay, you're not doing that bad, or how you're living's not not terribly bad. You know, you're, you're just making little mistakes. But you see, those little mistakes will come up and get you real fast if you're not careful. It talks about the perverseness of transgressors shall destroy them in verse 3. Tra another word for, per transgress for per perverseness, excuse me, is deceit that we talked about, but there where it says transgressors, it's another word you could put there is unfaithful. See, when we allow ourselves to become misled or we conceal the truth because we think that we're not doing that bad, 
that perverseness, you can transfer that, to, or not transfer, you can change that to ill nature. See, Satan wants you to get this in your head that you're, he wants to pervert your mind and your heart from how God is calling you to live and get this ill nature of how, you, how he wants you to live because when you're living how Satan wants you to live, you're ineffective. You can't do anything for the kingdom of God when you're constantly in a state of habitual sin. Proverbs 10, 9, it's a verse that we all are familiar with. It says, He that walketh uprightly walketh surely, but he that perverteth his ways shall be known. See, like we talked about already, you can hide your sin from your pastor. You can hide your sin from your family, from your friends, from your coworkers. But God sees everything. Amen. And your sin will be found out one way or another. It may be hidden from public eyes, but he can put conviction on you so strong that it breaks you. Don't let it get to that point. Don't let it get to that point. And another thing that I don't think we talk about enough is being a stumbling block. So you may not be living in sin, but how are you carrying yourself and how is that affecting your witness? I'm going to be 21 here in a couple weeks, and one of my friends at school, he asked me, he said, well, you're about to be 21, so I want to hear your thoughts on drinking alcohol. Are you going to, you know, have a drink when you turn 21? And I told him, I said, you know, I don't think any, there's anything biblically that says having a drink is wrong. I said, but I do know what is wrong. If, if I saw Brother Nick out at Applebee's and he was having a drink with his meal, I'm not going to have ill feelings towards Brother Nick because what he's doing is not wrong. But how about somebody who has been invited to this church and they see our pastor having a drink or they see me having a drink or they see Brother Josh having a drink or they see one of you having a drink. The way alcohol is perceived in our society, guys, is that one drink leads to two drinks and two drinks leads to four. And before you know it, people just assume if you have one drink that you're getting drunk at the end of the night or the end of the day. So the best advice that I can give you tonight is don't take part in that because I, I don't want to cause somebody else to stumble and turn away from Christ just because I want to do one thing that, might, that I might enjoy. See, there's nothing wrong with that one drink that you might have. But just think how many people you could cause to stumble because of that one drink. If you'll flip over to Romans, there's a verse I would like, I'd like to share. Romans 14, verse 13. It's talking about being a stumbling block. It tells us, let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. This is a commandment, guys. Don't, don't be a stumbling block for others. And then there's a verse in Matthew, Matthew 18, verse 6. It's kind of the same thing, but this is Jesus talking. Matthew 18, verse 6, it tells us, But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and that he were drowned in the depths of the sea. That, that verse is telling us if you call somebody to stumble, whether it be a young Christian or a lost person, it would be better for you to drown yourself because you just think, how can you turn somebody away by one of your actions? We need to be cautious of how we act and who we, what we do certain things around because you may not think it's bad, but we need to be careful and mindful of how others may perceive it and the thoughts that it could cause them to have. How do you act at a ball game? I, I like, yeah, crickets. We shout at ball games at the referees or at coaches for not coaching right or the referees ain't calling right. You know, it's funny. I've kind of got now to the point where I just watch people at ball games. It's real funny. People don't yell at the referees until they start losing. It's not ever the referee's fault till your team's losing. But, you know, I was thinking about it. And we all, know the, we all know a person who goes insane at a ball game, at the referees, at a coach. And what, what's your thoughts of that person? What do you think about that person when that happens? Or if you're sitting in your house or you're at a restaurant watching a ball game and there's people going crazy screaming at the TV that, that nobody can hear. How, what do you think about that person? Have you ever been in those shoes? How do you think that's affected your witness? 
Are you living with integrity by how you act around others? And I'm not saying we should live and be walking on, you know, spikes, worried about making other people feel good about themselves. Because we shouldn't be ashamed of our faith. We shouldn't be ashamed to be a Christian. Amen. But you do need to be careful and mindful of the impact you're having on somebody else. So you can allow yourself to become deceived and you're wrapped up in your unfaithful and unrighteous living and before you know it, you're dead spiritually. There's so many churches that are dead spiritually. You other pastors and preachers, you can all attest to a church you've been to that was dead as a doorknob. I mean, there was, it's about like when I said that about the ball game, it was silent and that's how it was the entire service. There was, there was one church I went to, and thank goodness my dad went with me, so I had somebody amen in me, or it would have been like I might as well have been preaching to an empty church. But, you, I mean, there's some time people will scream at a TV, scream at a ball game, or scream at whatever, but then they come to God's house and they sit with their mouths closed. You know, what, what is that ball game going to get you in the long run? We were, we were talking about it, me and my mom, and, you know, as an Alabama fan, this year's been a little bit of a struggle at times. We hadn't looked the best, and we were talking about a game. I can't remember which one it was, and, and I said, you know, if Alabama wins another game or they lose the rest of them, it really don't matter because the sun's still going to come up the next day. And, you know, regardless if Alabama wins or loses or Auburn wins or loses or Fife wins or loses or Plainview wins and loses, whoever it is, Jesus is still on the throne, guys, and the sun's still going to come up, and we need to care about stuff that matters. And I'm not saying you can't enjoy sports, you can't enjoy your hobbies, but there's greater things in life. There's, we, have, we have a greater purpose, and we're called to such a higher standard of living than that. And there, there's a sermon I really would encourage you all to listen to. I listened to this week. It's Dr. Larry Brown. For those of you who don't know, he, was, he started Victory Baptist Church, where C.T. Townsend's now the pastor. He started it back. He built it up, and he was the pastor there, and C.T.'s now the pastor. But the sermon's called Ain't Nobody Like Him. And if you're ever down in the dumps, that, that sermon will lift you up. And I was doing some homework, and I'd finished up, and I'd saw it, and I'd saved it on my YouTube to go back and listen to it, and... You know, talking about that young man before we started tonight, I've kind of just been down, you know, worried about him, and there's been some other things going on, and I was like, you know, I'm going to just listen to that sermon. Maybe, you know, maybe that'll lift me up. Maybe that'll give me some encouragement. And in a dorm room on a Tuesday night, we, I about had church in my living room just watching a sermon. Amen. And then I get up Wednesday Amen. morning and open my Bible to Hebrews, to chapter 4. It's very familiar. We all know it. And I just sat there and cried reading my Bible. I mean, it was just overwhelming. So sometimes you just need to get along with God, and he'll bring you out of the dumps. Amen. Amen. Moving on, if you want to turn over to James, we'll be there for the rest of the night. In chapter 1, we're just going, not going to read all of it for the sake of time. But the third point I would like to bring out tonight is that your willingness to sin leads to a diminishing faith. A willingness to sin leads to a diminishing faith. Verses 2 through 6 are very familiar passages or verses, and we're going to read them. It says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. And then verses 12 and through 14 said, blessed is, blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to, to them that love him. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Like I've already said tonight, you can try to fight sin on your own, but I can guarantee you this, you're going to lose every time. You're going to lose that battle every time. Because, you see, a lot of times we, we think of the devil, we think of Satan, and we think he's dumb. 
And, you know, he is dumb because he thinks he's going to beat Jesus, but that ain't never going to happen. But, you know, we're, we're the dumb ones because we, you know, he's deceived us and caused us to stumble into sin so many times. And we think, well, I can fight it on my own. I can, I can conquer this sin on my own. And we failed hundreds and thousands of times. We, we fail every day. But you see, we're going to be tempted. Those, those verses tell us about it. But the thing is, if you're struggling with something, you need to just take it to God and let him take care of it. Because you can sit there and you can fight that sin. You can waste, you're going to be wasting your time fighting that sin because you can't do it alone. And then in verse 15 there of chapter 1, it says, Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Continual sin in your life is going to lead to a calloused and a hardened heart, and eventually there's going to become a, a state in your life spiritually where there's no remorse. There's no conviction on your life for your sin because you've just done it over and over, and there's no repentance. There's no attempt to change. And eventually you're just going to build up a, a block, a barrier between your soul and the, and the convicting power of, of Christ because you just, you're just living in this sin. You're, you're wallowing in it. And the thing is, while we're living in sin, we still expect God to move in our lives. But it, it don't work like that. Like Miss Laureen said this morning, God wants to give, give, a, give us blessings. He wants to pour blessings out on our lives. And a lot of times we expect him to do all the work and us not have to do anything in return. But it don't work like that. We have to put in the effort to change. We have to put in the effort to seek him out if we want to be able to have that relationship with him, if we want to desire his presence in our lives. And I think a lot of times, because of how us as, as Baptists, we talk about God's grace and his mercy, and Brother Nick's talked about it. But I just, tonight, I want to just nail this point home with you. Salvation is so much more than a get-out-of-hell-free card in our lives. Amen. We, a lot of times we think, well, we get saved and it stops there. That's, that's, that's just the beginning. See, once you get saved, there's this process called sanctification, and it starts from the moment you're saved till the, till the day you die. And you have that time to either grow closer to, grow closer to God or you, you grow away from Him based on how you live your life. And there's a quote from J. Vernon McGee I, I read this week. And I want to share it with y'all. It says, Faith is the root of salvation. Works are the fruit of salvation. Faith is the cause of salvation. Works are the result of salvation. I'm going to read it again because I think Nick is the only one who got that. It says, Faith is the root of salvation. Works are the fruit of salvation. Faith is the cause of salvation. Works are the result of salvation. Amen. See, there should be a change in your life that day you get saved and there should be fruit that people are able to see in your life of, of how God's working in your life and how he's moving in your life. But a lot of times we don't allow, we can't bear fruit because we're not doing nothing to grow closer to God. We get saved and, well, we think that we're okay because we're going to heaven. But like, like I said, there's so much more than just you're getting to heaven because I don't know about y'all, but I want to be able to drag some people in with me to heaven. I don't, you know, there's people in everybody's life that you know there's somebody you work with or a friend or a family member that's lost and you know it's all happy hunky dory that your family and your house is saved but you know we need to be selfless we need to try to drag as many people in there to heaven with us as we can Amen. so don't let your willingness to sin don't let don't first off don't be willing to sin because if you do it's going to lead to a diminishing faith and lastly the, the thing I want to nail home about integrity is what it can do for you. The last thing is integrity leads to a worldly deviance. And a lot of times we, when we think of deviance, we think of deviating from the cultural or the worldly norms. And as Christians, we should, be, we should deviate from Amen. cultural norms. Amen. You know, a, a worldly deviance is, well, your, your abnormal people would say, uh, people who are in the LGBTQ movement are deviating from norms. People who um, are in these communities where you can go have sex with anybody, um, people would say that is deviating from cultural norms. Uh, people 
well, now it used to be deviating from being selfless and being selfish and only worrying about yourself was deviance. But now that's where how you're instructed to live your life is only worry about you and how much money you can make because that's how you're going to get happy. But as Christians, we should be deviating from what's normal in our society. You know, that those sexual sexual sins that are so encouraged today, we need, we need to deviate from stuff like that. When the world tells us to be prideful and only worry about me, myself, and I, we need to deviate from that because Jesus was the total opposite of being a prideful person. He cared about others way more before he ever thought about caring for himself. In our society today, sin is accepted and encouraged. Kids are encouraged to rebel if they don't like what their parents are teaching them. Kids are encouraged to do what they want to, do what makes them happy. It doesn't matter if mom and dad think it's wrong and they tell you it's wrong. It's your life. You live it how you want to. The only thing we should be worrying about who's telling us how to live our life is how this book tells us to live our lives. Because this book never fails. It's a 100 out of 100, 100% never fails. And I don't know any self-help book or any worldly claim or psychologist or doctor that has a 100% success rate. The only doctor I know is the one who wrote this book that's successful every single time. If you want to see change in your home or in your school's kids or at your workplace, it starts with you. It starts with you living with integrity in your life. And integrity, we'll go back to it. The quality of being honest and having strong moral principles, moral uprightness. How do you live your life? Do you live with integrity? Are you honest with yourself when you're struggling with sin? Are you honest with yourself about that? Do you have strong moral principles? Do you have a strong Christian foundation in your life? Is there not that because you're not in his word, you're not talking to him in prayer daily? And I'm not talking about just saying the blessing over your meals or something. I'm talking about actually having conversations with Jesus every day. Because if you talk to him, he'll tell you how to fix what's going wrong in your life. If you seek him out, he's going to correct what's going wrong. Are you living righteously? Brother Nick talks about that all the time, righteous living, and how important it is for us to live righteously. I, I encourage you tonight. I want to challenge you to live with integrity. Verse 18 there in, in James chapter 1 tells us, Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. And when I read that, the, the term first fruits really kind of confused me. And I, I sat there and pondered on it. And I, eventually I looked it up. And it tells us there that we are his first fruits. And first fruits were the very first produce agriculturally of a season. Especially, they were made special to be given as an offering to God. They were always understood to be the best of the best. So, it tells us that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creation, of his creatures, sorry. We are his first fruits. We are his best. If you read the creation account, he, he always said it was good at the end of the day, but if you recall, it says when he created humans that it was very good. We hold a special place in the eyes of God, and I wonder tonight, I want to challenge you, are you being a first fruit? Are you worthy to be called that in your life? Are you Christ's best? Are you living as one of his best? Are you carrying yourself in that manner? And I know that the world's bleak. It looks bad. But people are still searching for something. Amen. I've always looked at it this way. There's Everybody has a hole in their heart that only Jesus can fill. You can fill it with whatever you want to. You can fill it with all the sin you want, all the drugs, the alcohol, the pornography, whatever you may want to try to fill it with. And it'll fill it for a season. But eventually you're going to be searching because people keep going back to it. One dose of Jesus is all you need, and that'll take care of that hole in your heart. Amen. So tonight, maybe you're searching for something. Maybe you can't live with integrity because you don't have the one inside of you that can show you how to live with integrity. 
So maybe that's you tonight, or, or maybe you're struggling with pride, or you're struggling, you're deceiving yourself about the sin in your life, or you're just willingly, willingly sinning, and it's destroying your faith and your spiritual walk. I want to encourage you to begin tonight living with integrity, because if we truly want to see a difference, it starts with the church living right, and the church living with integrity, and us being the impact that we're called to be. I'm going to pray for us, and... John, you can get us a song keyed up. Let us pray, God. We just thank you for tonight. We thank you for allowing us to come to your house. We thank you for the services we've had today, God. I just pray that during this time of invitation that you would just move on the hearts and the souls of these people, God. I pray if there's somebody who's lost, God, you'd save them. If there's somebody who's walked away from you, God, or they're not living how you've called us to live, God, that they would come make that right with you tonight. God, I pray that you would be honored and glorified through this invitation, God. I pray that all that's accomplished, God, that it would be for you and you alone. And I just thank you and I ask all this in your name. Amen.